Welcome back to this lecture series for ethics. In this video we're going to continue our discussion of Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics and we should recall a few of the points we made in our previous video. Previously we saw Aristotle's picture of human life and more specifically his account of human action. He says every action or skill or choice that you make has some specific goal or purpose. And this is true from the more mundane actions of our lives. What should I have for lunch? Uh, what am I going to watch on TV tonight? Should I mow the lawn or not? All the way to more seemingly substantial or meaningful decisions. Um, where should I go to school? What sort of career should I pursue? Um, should I build a life with my significant other? Any of these decisions, any of these actions that you take in accordance with those decisions, has some sort of goal or purpose. And as we saw also, Aristotle doesn't think that life can just be one goal or one action leading to the next, leading to the next. It can't just be that we pursue one goal and then we pursue the next goal and the next goal, and just this goes on to infinity with no ultimate aim or purpose in mind. In fact, he says, for it to make sense for us to act or have desires at all, it must be the case that there's some final good, some chief good, some ultimate purpose to human life. So from the very beginning, Aristotle gives us a picture where human life is not just a random, chaotic um, set of events. It's not simply, as I said last time, about the journey. It's fundamentally about the destination. A human life lived well is lived toward a certain destination, toward a certain goal. And a human life lived poorly is one that is not lived in accordance with that goal. So if we accept that sort of picture where human life is fundamentally purposive, then the next question we should ask is, well, what is this final end? What is this chief good that Aristotle says gives structure and makes sense of all human action? And starting in chapter 4, Aristotle tells us what this final good is. So he says, most people, I should think, agree about what it is called. Since both the masses and sophisticated people call it happiness, understanding being happy as equivalent to living well and acting well. Now you'll recall this uh, previously, um, in the very first week of class, we talked about how Aristotle conceives of happiness as related to ethics and morality and means living well and acting well. But for the moment, I want to focus on this idea of happiness. Because this is basically Aristotle's answer. He says, as we said before, every choice, every action you take um, pursues some intermediate end or in intermediate good, but eventually all the actions you take in your life are leading to some final end, and that final end is happiness. Now at first you might find this answer somewhat anticlimactic, right? You, we have this big build-up in the previous video where we looked at chapters 1 and 2, uh, to this idea that there's a chief final good that makes sense of your life. It's essentially an answer to the question, what is the meaning or purpose of human life? And then we get to chapter 4 where he gives us his answer and he says it's happiness. And you might say, well, that's somewhat anticlimactic. I mean, anyone would say <laughs> that, you know, the purpose of a human life could be happiness. But I think it's not quite as anticlimactic as it might seem because, in fact, for Aristotle really the questioning and the philosophizing starts now. Everyone might accept that the end of a human life is happiness, but the real question is, what does it mean to be happy? And to get a handle on what Aristotle means by happiness, it's first important to see that, in fact, the word happiness is an English translation of the Greek word uh, eudaimonia. So, this idea of eudaimonia, part of it, I think, is captured in the English word happiness, but I think it means more than this. Here are some other ways you might think of the concept of, of eudaimonia. You might think of it as happiness, okay, but you also might think of it as flourishing or well-being. Another way you might think of it is human excellence. I think the best way to think of eudaimonia is this idea of the person who has achieved this state has truly achieved human excellence and human perfection. They're flourishing, they're thriving in all the ways that a human being should. And to get a better, better handle on this, think about some ways in which the idea of like human flourishing or human excellence 
might diverge or be separate from happiness. Think about some examples of a way in which a person might be happy in some sort of straightforward sense, but we wouldn't say that person is flourishing. And I think the easiest examples of this are sort of just lives lived toward and oriented toward immediate satisfaction and immediate pleasure. So you might imagine someone who spends all their days in the basement playing video games or um, or becoming intoxicated or just searching after immediate pleasure. And there might be a sense in which you could say this person's happy because they're not dissatisfied. They have all the immediate pleasure they want in the moment. Um, and so you might say, well, yeah, we might say this person's happy, but are they flourishing? Well, that seems to be a different question. I mean, are they pursuing interesting knowledge? Are they developing their athletic abilities? Are they um, trying to become, you know, to develop their artistic abilities? Are they working on their capacity for human empathy and trying to be a more understanding, moral human being? Well, not really. And you might say, well, there's a sense in which you, you might be able to have a life of pleasure that isn't sort of an excellent human life, that isn't a life that really we would classify as being of human perfection. And so I think, roughly speaking, this is sort of the distinction that Aristotle has in mind. When we, so when you see the word happiness in the text of Aristotle, I want you to think about eudaimonia. I want you to think about this idea of human perfection or human excellence. Okay. Now, so the question is, what does eudaimonia consist of? And Aristotle, what he's going to do in the chapters we're going to look at now, he's going to consider, well, here are some possibilities and for what eudaimonia could be, what a eudaimonious life might look like. And he's going to eliminate those possibilities and sort of see what's left. So here's some of the first pass he gives at what might be involved in a, or, or sh should put it this way, a first pass he gives at the possible answers one could give for what a perfect, um, happy human life would look like. So he says the following, For the masses think it as something straightforward and obvious, like pleasure, wealth, or honor. Some thinking it to be one thing, others another. Often the same person can give different accounts. When he is ill, it is health. When he is poor, it is wealth. Okay, so I want to stop there for a moment. So he makes a couple points here. Notice first he says, The masses often think it to be something straightforward and obvious like pleasure, wealth, or honor. Now, the first question you might ask is, What does he mean by masses? Just most people, the everyday person, perhaps not a philosopher like Aristotle. And he says, the straightforward and, an and obvious answer you would get from just the average person you ask about what it means to be happy, they would say something like pleasure, or wealth, or honor. So why is that? Well, I think we can um, readily see that these are some of the most common things that people pursue in their life. We engage, um, you know, entertaining activities that are pleasurable. We like to, as best we can, avoid the presence of pain in our lives. Wealth is obviously a large motivator. Much Think about how much of your life is spent um, preparing yourself thinking and uh, for a career, thinking about what sort of career you want to have, and then actually engaging eventually in that career. And honor. And so what does he mean by honor? Just simply having a certain sort of status, gaining the praise of other people, having a good reputation. In very general terms, these are th three of the most common goods that are pursued by people in their day-to-day -day lives, whether they really think about it or not. And so I think when he says these are the, sort of the straightforward and obvious accounts, he thinks these are the most sort of common answers. And as we're going to see, it's not that he thinks pleasure, wealth, and honor are bad things, but he's going to give us reasons why none of those three things can in fact be, uh, be eudaimonia. None of these three, three things can be human happiness or perfection. Now, another point he makes here, so he says, again, often the same person can give different accounts. When he is ill, it is health. When he is poor, it is wealth. Now, the suggestion here is that this is also a sort of misguided answer to, to eudaimonia. This is a misguided answer to what constitutes human happiness. 
And why would this be? So, you know, think, he says the ill person very much values health. And this seems correct, right? When you're, when you're sick, when you're not feeling well, you just are sitting there wishing and say, I really wish I would feel much better. But think about once you've attained the state of health, you would obviously you still value health, but you don't think about it that much. It's not really a object of your pursuit. It's not something you are attempting to achieve. It's just sort of this background condition of your life, and now you can go on to do other things. Now, likewise, you might say the poor individual, the impoverished individual, is very concerned with wealth. Now, I think wealth is an interesting one because there's very many. Uh, it's actually it's a sort of marvel that I cannot personally understand in some way that many many extremely wealthy people continue to be strongly motivated by gaining more wealth and more money. But in general, we might say there's a sense in which the extent to which the actual amount of money you have um, is much more on your mind if you're impoverished and you don't have the money to pay the bills or pay your rent, or feed your children, money is, off, of course, much more on your mind than it is on the mind of a wealthy person who has tons of money to expend in all sorts of frivolous ways. So again, the reason he brings this up is, I think it makes an important suggestion about what human happiness is. So he's not going to say health and wealth aren't necessary for happiness in some sense, but it's not really what happiness is all about. Because whatever constitutes eudaimonia, whatever constitutes human happiness, must be something that we would want as a human being as such. We want health when we're a sick human being. We want wealth when we're a poor human being. But whatever human happiness truly is, must be something that's worthy of pursuit for all human beings, no matter what their state state they're in. Whether they're rich or poor, whether they're sick or healthy, etc., etc. So it has to be something that is worth pursuing for all human beings, no matter their state. And he continues on, he says, certain thinkers, and now we're getting much closer, as we should see, to Aristotle's view, certain thinkers used to believe that beyond these many good things, like health and wealth and honor and pleasure, there is something else good in itself, which makes all these good things good. And here we're seeing a hint at what Aristotle thinks the character that happiness must have. And this should be clear also from our previous video. We, so whatever happiness is, he says, it makes every good thing good. So again, you have lunch in order to satiate your hunger. Well, why are you doing that? You're satiating your hunger, so you'll have the energy to go to school and study. Why are you going to school and study? So you can gain knowledge and gain your degree and pursue your career path and um, have a stable life where you have the amount of money you need to live and pursue other important activities. So each step along the, the way, we say those are good things. Right? Nourishing your body, going to school, getting your degree, getting a career, having a stable life, having some money, all those are good things. But what makes them good? Why are they good? Aristotle says the only reason that any of those things are good is because they help you move closer to what the final end or purpose of human life is. And so whatever that final purpose is, which as he told us is happiness or eudaimonia, whatever that final purpose is, that's what explains why all these things are good. And so, this is what we're looking for. A sort of final good that can explain all of your actions. And that is the structure that, for Aristotle, human happiness must take. Okay, so he's given us some initial reflections on human happiness. And then he says, well, let's consider three different sorts of life. And let's consider what we might think about each of these kinds of life and whether each of these sorts of life can constitute human happiness. And I think it matters that he's not talking about just goods or um, sort of individual things, but he's talking about a kind of life. So he says there are these three kinds of life, the life of pleasure, the life of politics, the life of contemplation. What does he mean by a life of pleasure or life of politics? Well, it means a life oriented toward that thing, where you may, of course, do other things, but if you live the life of pleasure, your ultimate goal in life is to gain as much pleasure as you possibly can. 
and the life of politics, which really turns out to be more of a life of honor. If you live that life, your life is oriented. You do many things, but your ultimate sort of organizing principle of your life is to gain as much honor and status and recognition as possible. And the same with the life of contemplation. So the question we're asking is not whether pleasure is good, it's not whether honor is good. Right, because he does think pleasure is good to some extent. He does think honor is good to some extent. And contemplation, for him, is ultimately going to be much closer to what hap- human happiness truly is. So he's not saying, are these things good, in just in isolation. He's saying, is a life oriented toward those things good? And so he's going to consider each of these possibilities. So let's start with the life of pleasure. So here's what he says about the life of pleasure. The masses appear quite slavish by rationally choosing a life fit only for cattle. But they're worthy of consideration because many of those in power feel the same as Sardanapalus. Okay, there's a couple things here. So who is Sardanapalus? Um, According to an ancient legend, he was this king who was supposed to have lived just a life of complete pleasure and somewhat, I guess, Uh, ironic and tragically, he actually died in an orgy, according to the legend. And there's this famous painting uh, by Eugene Delacroix here, The Death of Sardanapalus, which uh, uh, depicts him and his life and and ultimately his death. So why is Aristotle bringing up this individual? Well, he's trying to think about the life of pleasure. And now you might think about the life of Sardanapalus and say, well, okay, well, I mean, maybe, you know, Sardanapalus' problem was not that he was pursuing pleasure, but that he's doing so in an immoderate and extreme way, to the point that it actually causes death. He might say too much of a bad thing. I mean, excuse me, too much of a good thing. But I think there's something deeper here. For Aristotle, it's not just that Sardanapalus was too extreme in his pursuit of pleasure, although he was. There was something wrong about the idea that his main goal in life was to pursue pleasure. And recall again the first part of this sentence. The masses appear quite slavish by rationally choosing a life fit only for cattle. The main problem with a life in pursuit of mere pleasure is that it simply is not fit for a human being. Now for cattle, for a cow, would be a perfectly fine life, right? You're a cow, you eat grass, you do whatever cows do, you mill around, right? And that's totally fine. There really is no higher good for a cow than just living a pleasurable, pleasant existence. But notice he says for a human being to live a life of that sort would be to turn yourself into sort of a slave. Right? That's what he means by says the masses appear quite slavish. Because you have these higher human capacities for reason and thought and imagination and love. And instead of using those capacities, you're instead just sort of making yourself a slave to the pursuit of pleasure, a slave to your appetites. And what this shows is that it gives us one condition that whatever eudaimonia is, it must meet this, one of the things it must meet is this condition. Eudaimonia cannot consist in that which human beings share with other species, beings, or forms of life. So again, partly human happiness or eudaimonia might be found in pleasure, um, but it can't be the primary good. It can't be that ultimate final aim which makes a human life well lived. Because at the end of the day, human beings are, in Aristotle's view, fundamentally different from any other form of life. A cow or a tree or a rock, right? Well, a rock's not a form of life, but any other being and any other form of life. So, there are a couple important claims here. To accept Aristotle's claim, you need to believe a couple of things. First, you need to believe that there is, in fact, a significant and fundamental difference between human beings and non-human animals, such that whatever is good for a human being can, must be distinct and, se- and separate from the good for a non-human animal. And not all philosophers believe this. We'll see later in this course Some philosophers have said that although there's distinctive types of human pleasure, that at the end of the day, the human good is pleasure. So, to believe Aristotle here, you do need to believe that there's a really sharp distinction between human beings and other forms of life. 
And you need to believe that whatever is good for us must partake of what is distinct about human beings. Whatever it is that makes human beings special, whatever it is that separates us from other forms of life, that is what our happiness and our flourishing and excellence needs to consist in. So that's the first fundamental thing we learn about eudaimonia from um, Aristotle's consideration of the life of pleasure. Now let's take a look at the life of politics. So here's what he says. Sophisticated people, men of action, and seen ha see happiness as honor. And this is why I'm really, um, it, as he says here, honor is pretty much the end of the political life. This is why I'm really calling this the life of honor, because I don't think Aristotle just has a life of politics here, the life of a politician. That would be included. But really, it's any life that's oriented toward reputation and status. So you could do this through business. You could do this um, really through any sort of professional role in which your, um, your goal could be in advancement and achievement and gaining recognition and praise from other people. Okay, so let's think about this life oriented toward honor, and here's what he says about, says about it. Honor, however, seems too shallow to be an object of our inquiry, since honor appears to depend more on those who honor than on the person honored. Whereas we surmise the good to be something of one's own that cannot easily be taken away. So what would this mean? Why would he think that the good of honor depends more on the people who are doing the honoring than the person who receives the honor? Well, so think about how it is you gain good reputation and praise from others. Fundamentally, you have to do something that other people like that they are pleased by. Right, so imagine, for instance, just because there's you know these award shows that make it sort of an easy example. Imagine you're an actor or an actress, and you know you star in many movies. And imagine your main goal is not necessarily to create something beautiful, to create something lasting or or meaningful or even entertaining. Your main goal is to win um, an Oscar, right? To pick up as many awards as you possibly can. Okay, now. Um, think about that sort of mindset and think about what you would have to do in order to succeed at that. Now, ideally, if we lived in an ideal world, you could create something beautiful and wonderful and lasting and deep and meaningful through your art, through your acting, and that would necessarily garner the praise and, um, and recognition of the people who decide who gets the award. But of course, that's not always the case, right? Um, you know, we might say, well, look, those who are given the awards don't properly understand what a painting should be, a, 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 what a movie or film should be like. Uh, they're not properly taking into account the values of beauty. They're just improperly evaluating what it, which movies are the best. And that can happen. It happens in all spheres of life, wherever there's some human being who's evaluating your performance. So that means if what you're really concerned, if, if you're not just saying, I'm going to try to do my best, and if awards come, that's great. If other people recognize my work, then that's great. But if you're really just oriented toward the honors themselves, then you're in a state where you have to please those who are doing the honoring. Which means your actions and the way you live your life is going to be determined by what those people think. And those people might change their minds over time, or they might be replaced by other people who think differently. And as soon as the people who are giving out the awards, as soon as they change, your actions have to change also. And you can think of it in another way as well. Think about the concept of a, uh, someone who's a, a people pleaser. Someone who constantly wants to do things that will make other people happy, right? That runs around wanting to make sure everyone's satisfied. Think about the sense in which you lose your own sense of integrity, your own sense of self, because you're not asking, what do I think is the proper thing to do? You're asking, what do Jim and Sally and George, what do they think is the right thing for me to do? And you have to constantly run around wondering, am I going to offend this person? Are they liking what I'm doing, what I'm doing, etc., etc.? And again, the most important point is the opinions of those people are not within your control. You cannot, you can control what you do, we'll say, but you can't control how other people react to what you do. You can't control 
how other people see or view what it is you're doing. And so this one, this is why Aristotle says the good must be something of one's own that cannot easily be taken away. And so this gives us a second condition which must characterize eudaimonia, which is that eudaimonia cannot be entirely or mostly dependent on matters that are outside of one's control. Largely speaking, your happiness and perfection and excellence as a human being must be something that you can achieve through skill, through effort, through training, which will become a large um, discussion in book two of the Nicomachean Ethics. Now, to be clear, Aristotle doesn't even think that your happiness has to be completely within your control. So as he says at another point, um, when one is suffering terribly or experiencing the greatest misfortunes, no one would call a person living this kind of life happy. So his point here is that, look, many misfortunes can befall us. Many things outside of our control can happen to us which would fundamentally undermine our human happiness. So you might contract a horrible disease or experience a true tragedy in your family, which um, is completely outside of your control and really undermines your ability to live a good life. So Aristotle isn't saying that human happiness is completely within our control, but whatever this final good is, it must be something which at least is largely within our control. And I'm not going to say more about this now because this is going to be essentially the main topic of next week. So I'll leave that there and we'll come back to it. Okay, now, finally, there's another aspect that I think Aristotle sees under this life of politics or honor. And because often, you know, a life in pursuit of politics and power or, um, or business often comes along with the pursuit of wealth. And so he says something about the life of money-making as well, which also shows us something important about uh, eudaimonia. The life of making money is a life people are, as it were, forced into. And wealth is clearly not the good we are seeking, since it is merely useful for getting something else. So first he notes that a life uh, in pursuit of money and wealth can't be what we're talking about. Because what is money? Money is a tool. Money is a tool which we use to get some other good. So we have money, we can buy food, we can buy a house, we can buy a yacht, you know, whatever. But the purpose of money itself is for the sake of getting something else. And this is why the the image of Scrooge McDuck, right, this character, um, this, this famous cartoon character, is supposed to strike you as fundamentally absurd. So Scrooge McDuck is is a character who's extremely wealthy um, and has all this money. He's got an entire room, just uh, piles of coins and bags of money, and he's literally swimming through it. And you wonder, why is he sitting on all that money? What's he doing with all that wealth? Well, nothing. He just loves to hold on to it. And you can probably think, to some extent, that there's you can share in this to some extent, like, It is a pleasing feeling if you look at your bank account and there's a little more money than there was before. You know, just having it in there makes you feel good. But when you take it to the extent of this, where you're literally hoarding money that you're never going to use, this is funny. It's it's comical precisely because it's so absurd because it gets money so incorrect. The purpose of money isn't to have for its own sake. The purpose of money is to use for various purposes. And so, this is why for Aristotle, the life in which you're consumed with making more money and more money and more money, not even for any specific use, not to help other people or even to buy a mansion, is just fundamentally backwards. Because, and, and look at again the way he describes the life of making money. The life of making money is the life where people are, as it were, forced into. Wealth should not be seen as an end in itself. Wealth is something, money is something you have to, you're forced into needing to get because of the things it can get for you. And so what does this show about eudaimonia? Again, we see a third condition. Eudaimonia must consist of that which is worth pursuing for its own sake. So another way to think about it is this. Whatever it is that constitutes human happiness... 
whatever it is that is the final ultimate purpose of human life, it can't be something which we're going to then have to use to get something else. Right? Once we've achieved human happiness, it must be the case that we say, okay, well, now we're done. Right? There is no further thing that I want with happiness. This was the goal. And in fact, you know, it's unlikely we would ever achieve it. We'll never achieve human perfection and excellence. That's part of the point. We can always work toward it. But were you to achieve it, you wouldn't now say, okay, let me put this in my pocket and use it to get something else. Whatever human happiness is, it must be valued for itself, must be valued for its own sake. So the life we're looking for cannot be a life of money or wealth. So now we have these three conditions, just to recap. First, whatever eudaimonia is, it must be something that's particular to human beings, not something we share with other forms of life. It must be something that is mostly, largely um, dependent, largely within our own control. And it must be something worth pursuing for its own sake. So with these three conditions, Aristotle eliminates the life of pleasure, because we share that with other animals. He eliminates the life of politics, honor, and wealth because, well, honor is dependent on other people and their opinions. Wealth is not something we value for its own sake. So remember, he had these three lives, and this leaves the life of contemplation. So for Aristotle, human happiness is largely going to be a sort of contemplation. But this should leave us with a number of questions. First, what is the life of contemplation? What are we supposed to be contemplating? And how is it that a life of contemplation, of thinking, of using reason, how can that produce human flourishing? So these are all the uh, questions we're going to need answer from Aristotle. Um, and we're going to continue to think about those questions as we move through the remaining books and chapters of the Nicomachean Ethics. Okay, so I will stop there. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope the video was helpful, and I will see you next time.